All right, so today we're gonna to talk about coherence theory still. And I'm gonna kind of re-motivate why we're, why we're here, uh, review some of the mathematical results from last time, which are mostly just kind of definitional, and, and then actually go into the meat of the calculation. So the reason why we're here, and you know, why we're even talking about coherence theory, is because there's this, this very interesting fact that if you put light into an interferometer, even though it's oscillating ridiculously quickly, and unless it's uh, an amazing laser, its spectrum has some finite width. And even if it's made of thermal light, like, uh, like white light that's, that's been filtered through a filter or even an LED, which has quite a broad spectrum, and is just created by random, random emissions with, with a broad spectrum, uh, you can work out the spectrum of that light by passing it through an interferometer and scanning one of the arms of the interferometer. So let me just share, uh, share little frames of the video that, that Georgia and I are working on. So here, here is the setup of the Michelson interferometer. Uh, there's a source here. In this case, we've got a mercury lamp. It's going through uh, a filter here, although it, this looks kind of clear that it's actually, you can mostly see a reflection, but it's a filter that's filtering just the, uh, the interesting green spectral line out of the mercury. And uh, eventually I'll replace this with a white light that's filtered in various ways and then eventually not filtered. I'll show you that in a second. It hits the, the half silvered mirror and part of the reflection bounces this way off of this mirror, which we can adjust with this micrometer. And it goes into the camera. That's one of the paths that the light can take. The other path the light can take is to continue on through this, uh, through this half silvered mirror go through this piece of glass, which just balances the amount of glass that each arm has to go through since this mirror is coated on the near side and not the far side. Um, bounces off this mirror, which you can adjust the tip and the tilt of with these two knobs. And that goes back, hits the, the coated front side of this mirror and half of that light goes and bounces into the camera. And so if you were to just look, so instead of having a light source here, if I just put a piece of paper with writing on it, and you just look, you, what you see is you see two copies of the writing and you can adjust the tip and the tilt of this mirror so that the two copies of the writing overlap each other. And then you know you've, you've aligned the interferometer that way. And then you can turn this micrometer back and forth and uh, depending on exactly where it is, if it's really close to equal path length, you, you see you see fringes. So in the, in the limit that this source was infinitely far away, it would be a plane wave. And if you had everything aligned perfectly, you would see all bright or all dark, all bright or all dark. Um, as we saw in the, in the homework and in one of the previous labs, when, when we had a laser that was uh, focused to a spot and then it was spread out, it acted more like a spherical wave. And so what it looks like there were two, two uh, point sources that were not, not uh, exactly on top of each other, but in line with each other. And that gave us this bullseye pattern, which I'll show in a second here. Now let me pull up the next video frame. And share it, hold on. Okay, Let's see if I can. Share that. Yes. There we go. All right. So hopefully you can see the the bullseye pattern. So this is what the the mercury source looks like through the interferometer because it's not infinitely far away. And here I'm I'm talking, and so things are vibrating on the scale of wavelengths of light. And uh, you can see the the bullseye pattern sort of jumping around. If I were to stop talking and stop touching everything, it would, it would settle down. And as I turn the, turn the knob to make the fringes go in one direction or another, let me see. Oh yeah, let me start maybe here. So I'm gonna start turning the, the knob to 
bring the path lengths closer and closer and closer. So as I'm turning the knob, the fringes go by so quickly that it just looks like a blur. And I keep turning it, turning it, turning it. And as you saw with the laser, the fringes are going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. But the fact that I see fringes at all from a source that's not a laser, it's just a, a lamp zapped with electricity, giving off light by uh, basically electrical excitation and, and random, random emission, means that I don't need an infinitely precise uh, coherent source. I don't need a perfect sine wave to see interference. And the, the goal of today is going to show that even, you know, let me share this other screen, even, uh, even things with a very broad spectral range, like white light, can, can show interference effects as long as the path lengths are really close together. And the, uh, well, well let, me, let me show that video for a second. So here is white light, white light interference fringes. So there's no spectral filters anywhere except in the camera, just to give you, because it's a color camera. But there's nothing in the system that, that filters the light. It's just white light. And here the mirrors aren't perfectly aligned. I, I tilted them a little bit on purpose so you could see stripes rather than, uh, rather than all, all or nothing. You know, if, if I had that perfectly aligned, you would just see one color or other. So there I moved, I moved the interferometer so it's no longer close to equal path length. And here I'm getting back closer to equal path length. I'm tilting the mirrors around a little bit. You can see on the bottom, let me pause this for a second. Uh, oops. On the bottom there, oops. Uh, where did I want? Yeah, on the bottom here, uh, because the mirror is tilted back, the bottom of the mirror is really close to equal path length. You get uh, you get really dark darks and really bright brights, and all the colors, the darks from all the colors line up all together. And because the mirror is tilted back a little bit, as you go up, the uh, the red stripes are not aligned with where the blue stripes or the yellow stripes are anymore. Uh, because the places where the peaks of red interfere constructively are, uh, are here and here and here and here. And the places where the blue interfere constructively are, are at different places. Uh, so, so you can actually see interference with white light fringes. And just from this picture, you can imagine that uh, you can tell something about the spectrum of, of the light. And today we're going to work out how if, if I tilted this mirror back and I didn't, I didn't see stripes, I just saw kind of plane wave interference, all bright, all dark. If I turned the knob really slowly and carefully and I measured the pattern that went by, uh, I, what I'm measuring is actually the Fourier transform of the spectrum of the light. So that's, that's the goal today is to, to finally show that as you turn the knob and you measure the intensity as a function of distance, where, where everything is perfectly aligned, um, the pattern you get out is the Fourier transform of the intensity. And it's, let, let me just write, write the result we're going for. It's, I said it's, it's almost true. There's one, one little tweak here. So the intensity that is measured on a detector uh, a color insensitive detector. So imagine, you know, just a black and white camera or a black and white uh, photo uh, power meter uh, that just senses total power. It has a function of tau, which is the, the delay of the two sources. This, this is a constant offset because the intensity always has to be positive. So this is actually the intensity of the source itself if I didn't put it through the interferometer plus the Fourier transform of the intensity spectrum. So I'm going to go from minus infinity, infinity, d omega over 2 pi, um, the intensity spectrum, which I'm going to write as I tilde, so it's a Fourier transform of omega, and the e to the i omega tau, because my, my time-like variable is the time delay from, from having two copies of the of the source be at slightly different places. So let me just draw, draw a picture of the interferometer again and remind you where, where this tau comes from. So this is just a, a drawing of what you saw in the video. There's some light source. 
like a, a mercury lamp or an LED or a white light. And it goes into an interferometer and the interferometer has a half silvered mirror. Half of the light goes through, half of the light reflects. Um, here we had a mirror that could move. So it's either there or there. And depending on how far it moves, we call that distance D. And there's a mirror here, which as long as you tip and tilt it so that everything is uh, perfectly perpendicular, uh, you, you see uh, that, well, what, what the light that comes back that bounces off of these mirrors, uh, half of which will go this way from this mirror and half of which will go that way from that mirror. And it goes into the detector like a camera or your eyes, if you're just looking into it. Um, what, what you see, this is equivalent to the following. So if, if I were to just look through this, I, it looks like I see two copies of the source that are in different positions. And if I tilt this mirror back and forth, the, the positions go left and right or up and down. But if I, if I align them so that they're on top of each other and I just change the distance, what it looks like from the, from the detector's perspective is just two copies of the source, one, one here and one a, a, an additional distance right behind it. And they're, they're overlapping. And so this distance here is actually 2D, right? Because the light has to go, if I move this mirror by D, light has to go an additional D and an additional another D before it goes into my eye. So this is 2D. And if I were to think of this in terms of a, a waveform, so I'm looking at the light from these, from these two, uh, two sources that are separated, they're right behind each other, a distance D, but they're adding up coherently. If I look at this in terms of a waveform, E of T, um, you know, say this is a, a mercury lamp, so it's it's mostly green, but there's still some spread, and it's pretty random because it's thermal emission. So maybe it sort of looks like this, like this, and then you know there's some pattern here. What I see is E of T, and then E of T plus this additional delay tau, and that just shifts the pattern over a little bit. So I'm gonna do my best to draw a similar looking random random pattern. And this is just shifted over, shifted over by some amount tau. And if I were to convert this in time, that, that's just the speed of light travel time for this 2D. That's a really short amount of time because this, this distance here is usually you know, tens of microns, hundreds of microns maybe. Uh, so the, the actual tau is 2D over C. But we're gonna work in tau just because uh, it's easier to write write all the Fourier transforms and do all the math in terms of tau. Uh, okay, so so uh, let, let me let me just remind you of what this what this i i tilde of omega means. It's it's the spectrum of the light. So if I if I plot this as a function of frequency or or angular frequency omega, and say I had some source that had you know a little bit of red and maybe a little bit of blue. Well, this would be like a purple source. There's some some at some red frequency, some at some blue frequency. And I were to pass this through a prism or a diffraction grating or something, and I were to measure this spectral pattern. This I tilde of omega is a spectral density. It doesn't have units of intensity, which which these two things do. It has units of intensity per angular frequency. So it's a, sort of in some small angular frequency bin here. That's, that's the intensity. So if you make your bins, you make your bin smaller, the density in that, in that bin stays the same, even though the total amount of light that gets through into that bin uh, shrinks. So this is a, like a probability density rather than an actual probability. So intensity per angular frequency. And uh, let me, that's sort of a reminder of the, some of the concepts. Let me remind you of, of the de definition in a little bit more mathematical detail. I think I'm gonna erase, erase my interferometer. Uh, now remember that tau, tau is, 
is not an actual time. It's just it's just the light travel time to go that extra little bit of distance. But once you have the interferometer set up, you set it to a certain d, a certain distance offset, and then you just take your hands off of it and record the data. So so no actual uh, you know, tau does not pass as, as time passes. You, you turn it to a different, a different distance, and then that gives you a different uh, relative delay. Uh, but it has units of time because it's the, the, the distance, uh, the, the time that the, the extra time that light needs to, to go from the one copy of the source to the other copy of the source. So let me just review what, what we talked about last time, just kind of some, some definitions here. There's the, the source is going to emit some electric field, E of t. We want to write that as a superposition of plane waves, a superposition of e to the i omega t, each weighted by some amount, which we'll call e tilde of omega. Um, and we want to add up all of these different plane waves at all different frequencies in a continuous way. So we want our electric field not to be made up of discrete delta function spikes, but some continuous smear of frequencies. So we'll integrate from minus infinity to infinity of d omega over 2 pi. And the 2 pi is just to, if we were to change, change units back to real frequency, uh, two, oops, 2 pi. Sorry, I got, got this backwards. Omega is 2 pi f. If we were to change units back to real, real frequency, um, this would just be a, a df, and the 2 pi would end up up here in the exponent. And so this, this weighted sum of complex exponentials, this, this is how we want to write our, our E of t, some spectrum. But this is, a, this is a Fourier transform pair. E of t and E tilde of omega form a Fourier transform pair. This is the, the definition of the Fourier transform going from, from frequency back to time with the, with the right factors of 2 pi to, to make the units or to make the uh, Factors of two pi uh, are, are the right convention here for us. Um, what, what I showed last time was that if you calculate the intensity of the source itself, so this is not passing it through an interferometer, you just take your lamp and you put up, a, put up an intensity meter. That's what I naught is. Intensity of the source itself, well, by definition, that's this one over eta to get it to the right units, magnitude of the electric field squared, averaged over time. And we had to be a little bit careful here with our time average. And this sort of introduces a little bit of uh, kind of extra, extra ugliness because we're not, we're measuring a, an intensity of uh, power per area. So to measure an intensity, we have to average over some amount of time. We can't average over infinite time, even though we want to take that limit. We'll average over some finite amount of time, but we'll, we'll take that limit anyway. So we'll take the limit as, oops, not, no, over there, there's the limit as uh, as the amount of time we're averaging over goes to infinity of the integral from minus t over two to t over two. So this is an interval t long of the magnitude of e squared. So that's what we mean by a time average. So we're averaging, and and this this t here. Um, for any any actual measurement, it's it's some finite amount of time, you know, seconds, milliseconds, nanoseconds, even. That's still way way slower than the speed at which t changes, which is picoseconds, femtoseconds. So uh, even our fastest detectors are are, you know, we think of a nanosecond not as an infinite amount of time. This we might be worried about this limit, but it's infinite compared to the, the speed at which the the wave is moving. And last time we. We showed that if we plug this in, uh, we we get that this is. And I'm going to write it a little bit uh, evocatively here. So minus infinity to infinity, d omega over two pi. I'm going to bring the eta all the way in, so one over eta, uh, and the limit limit as t goes to infinity of the magnitude of e tilde. Of omega 
squared. Sorry, that's a little bit off the screen. Um, and this, this whole thing here, starting from the one over eta and including the limit, even though this doesn't actually depend on time, I'm just, I just need to include this limit for, for mathematical consistency reasons. Um, this, this whole thing here is, is the, the power spectrum of the intensity, or the intensity spectrum, let me call it that. So the intensity tilde of omega. So this would be like if I had my light that was my purple light that had a little bit of red and a little bit of blue. And this is my, my I tilde of omega. If I were to integrate over this whole, this whole spectrum for all possible angular frequencies of light, I would get back just the total intensity that I would measure by just holding up a power meter to the whole purple light. That's, that's why I'm defining this, this thing in parentheses as the total intensity. And today we're, we're gonna show that if you, instead of just holding up the power meter to the light directly, if you pass the light through an interferometer and you delay it by tau and you sweep over all the taus, what you get is the, the bare intensity that you would have got without the interferometer plus this interesting thing, which is the Fourier transform of the spectrum. And then you can, Fourier transforms are invertible. So once you have this, you can subtract off the intensity from just measuring the light itself. And, and now you have the, the Fourier transform of the power spectrum, uh, which, which you can then compute. Okay, so, so let's, let's do that. Let's, let's uh, pass this whole thing through an interferometer. And let me see, what do I wanna keep? Uh, I may end up doing a lot of erasing here. So uh, why don't I, yeah, why don't I just start at the bottom? And, uh, and I'll sort of loop, loop up at the top. There's some, some long equations where I'll end up doing a bunch of erasing. Uh, okay, so, so what, what do you see when you look into that interferometer? Well, you see two copies of the source, but uh, let me, I should have uh, redrawn it here. So here's our mirror. Some goes that way, some goes that way. There's our other mirrors, and this is where you're looking. So the light splits here and goes to the mirror and comes back and the light splits. He, the other half of the light goes here and, and comes back. Um, but we, we don't, what, when, when we have a 50-50 mirror, that's 50-50 in intensity, that means that each copy of the electric field is one over square root of two. So the, the detector, detector doesn't really see the electric field plus the electric field delayed by tau. Since, since some of the light bounces back into the source, we actually see one over the square root of two electric field plus one over the square root of two electric field delayed by tau. Uh, and the square root of twos are to account for the reflectivity here and the fact that some of the light bounces back into the source, it gets lost. And, and remember tau is this, uh, tau is 2d over the speed of light. So it just had some constant depending on where I've adjusted the, the mirror. All right, so now, now let's actually calculate sort of the, 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 the thing we want, which is this intensity, intensity as a function of tau. And eventually we'll get to this, but there's quite a few intermediate steps. So it's always one over eta times the time average of the electric field, magnitude squared. So let me write the time average here. And now let me write the electric field magnitude squared here. So it's gonna be one copy of this times its complex conjugate. And let me just pull out all the square root of twos. So the square root of twos from, from the, the first copy and the square root of twos from the complex conjugate are gonna to combine to give me an overall factor of one half here. And the first one is just e, e of t plus e of t plus tau. And the complex conjugate is just, I'll just write this as e star of t plus e star of t plus 
tau. Give myself a little bit more room here. T plus tau. Okay, so now you can imagine what we want to do now, and this is why it's going to get a little bit messy. We want for each of these four terms, uh, we want to plug in this Fourier transform, you know, write E as a superposition of plane waves with the right amplitudes. And then we'll have a whole bunch of terms and cross terms, and then we'll perform the time average, which uh, we'll actually just mostly get rid of a lot of terms. So that, that will end up taking, you know, maybe 10 or 15 minutes. So, so let's, let's do that. Let's, let's plug in this definition here into here. And unfortunately, I don't want to erase anything, but I, I have to. So I was kind of, kind of hoping to keep this as the goal since that's, that's the line we'll end on. But let me, let me erase it. I will just refer back to it as, uh, as we get to there in the end. All right, and, and this is a, all the techniques that, that we're gonna do here mathematically are, are pretty similar to the techniques we did last time and very similar to any, any time you're dealing with Fourier transforms of a signal, you're often doing these kind of similar manipulations. So I just erased the thing I wanna substitute in. That's fine, whole deal. I wish this light board were much, much, much bigger. Okay, so, so my eye, I of tau here. Let me pull out the one over two eta. Uh, I'll keep the time uh, time average here. Now, the, the first term I'm going to write e of tau as the thing I just erased. So, integral from minus infinity to infinity d omega over two pi e tilde of omega e to the i omega t. So this is just writing e of t as the Fourier transform of the, um, well, as the inverse Fourier transform of the spectrum, writing it as a sum of plane waves weighted by the spectrum. Um, and this, this other term is very similar. So in fact, it's gonna be all the same things, but instead of a t, it's gonna be a t plus tau. So I could even just write this as uh, e to the i omega t plus tau. Okay, so that's my first set of, of uh, terms. This is e of t and e of t plus tau. And now for the second thing in parentheses, I need to take the complex conjugate of everything and then finally end it with a average over time. So, Eventually, I want to treat this as a, uh, oops, this should be a plus here. I want to treat this as a, uh, as a, a continuous sum of a whole bunch of terms. And I want to treat the complex conjugate as a continuous sum of a whole bunch of terms. And whenever you do that, you have all kinds of cross terms. In order to keep track of the cross terms, you always need to choose a different integration variable. So, Instead of integrating over d omega, I'm just going to integrate over d omega prime so that I don't mix, ter mix terms from this first continuous sum with terms from the second continuous sum. Um, so omega is real, so that the complex conjugate that doesn't affect that. Um, here the complex conjugate is affected, so I'll put a star here. The, the weights are complex because they depend on the magnitude of the spectrum and the phase. Uh, and here it's pretty obvious what happens is minus i omega prime t plus e to the minus i omega prime t plus tau. Okay, so that, that, is, that is our intensity that is measured at the detector. Now, uh, let me erase the next line. And let's start multiplying out and start considering all the cross terms. Any questions so far or the suspicious things I've done? 
mathematically. Not yet. Okay. All right, so let me leave myself lots of room for this line because I want to combine everything. So one over two eta, just coming along for the ride here. Time average of, let me pull the integrals out. So I have an integral from minus infinity to infinity d omega over two pi, integral from minus infinity to infinity d omega prime over two pi. Uh, let me write the spectral weights here, e tilde of omega, e tilde star of omega. And now there's four, four terms here. So all these will be uh, multiplied out. So the first term is just e to the i. Let me write this as omega minus omega prime t. All right, so e to the i omega t minus i omega t is this. Then we get the, the cross term this way. So plus e to the, uh, let, me, let me group the t's and keep the tau separately. So this is i omega minus omega prime t, that's this term and that term, minus i omega prime tau. Okay. And that, now I have this cross term here, which is e to the i omega minus omega prime t. So that's this term and that term. And the taus are plus i omega tau. And finally, uh, finally we get these last two terms multiplied together. So this is plus e to the i omega minus omega prime t plus i omega minus omega prime tau. Oops. Omega minus omega prime tau. All that close parentheses, close, uh, close time average bracket. Okay, that was, that was pretty much the hardest um, hardest thing. Now, in order to do any of these integrals, we're going to actually have to write the time average. So let me, uh, let me make sure I've got that right. So this this is 1 over 2 eta. Now I'm going to write the time average out, again, as the limit as t goes to infinity of the integral from minus t over 2, t over 2 of uh, dt of all of this stuff. So integral uh, d omega over 2 pi, integral d omega prime over 2 pi, e tilde omega e star omega and then these four terms one two three four i'm not going to write them out because i haven't really done anything okay so that just defines the time average okay so what is the next step i have three integrals infinity to infinity minus infinity to infinity i have three integrals and all of these converge for any real finite spectrum measured for a finite amount of time. So I don't have to worry about that. I can rearrange them how I see fit. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this, this time integral here. I'm going to move it all the way over, because none of these things depend on time, all the way over here. And now I'm going to apply this time integral to each of these terms. So the limit as t goes to infinity. So this is in that limit. This is an integral from minus infinity to infinity dt of stuff. And remember last time I taught slash reminded you that the, 
integral from minus infinity to infinity dt of some generic e to the i omega t. This is the delta function, two pi delta of omega. So in the limit where these limits of the integral really do go to infinity, this integral turns in, into a delta function. Uh, and so we can use that in each of these four terms pretty easily. So let me see. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll just write this on top. All right, still good, still following. I think there's maybe two more steps and then and we're done. So it's, it'll, it'll clear up, it'll clean up real fast. Okay, so I still have these integrals here. Minus infinity to infinity, d omega over two pi, minus infinity to infinity, d omega prime over two pi, um, E tilde omega, E tilde star omega. Um, and I guess I'll write, maybe on the next line, I'll write these, these four terms. Okay, so the integral of this first one, there is just either the I something T, so that something goes inside of the delta. So we have a two pi delta of omega minus omega prime. Uh, looks nice, now we can do the omega prime integral, the two pi's even cancel. We'll do that in the next step. Here we have similar thing. We've got another delta of omega minus omega prime, but here there's a, a minus i uh, minus i omega prime tau. So let me let me just if you look at all of these, all of these end up the only time dependence is exactly like this. So the integral of all four of these starts off this way with the delta function. So let me just keep that there. Let me write what remains as this is gonna be one for this one plus e to the minus i omega prime tau. For this one plus i, oops, plus e to the i, e to the i omega t, uh, omega tau for this one and plus e to the i omega minus omega prime tau for that last one. Okay. Uh, uh, these should be omega primes. No one caught that. But fortunately that doesn't matter because now we're gonna use this delta function to do this d omega prime integral and once I do that, every time I see omega prime, I can just replace it with omega. So that makes my life pretty easy. Oh, and I forgot the one over two eta here. So let me, let me do that. And then we're one line away from being done. And then we'll talk about the interpretation a little bit. Okay, so doing this one over two eta, we still have this integral from minus infinity to infinity, d omega over two prime, we still have the, the omega integral. We no longer have this integral. And now omega, we have e of omega, e star of omega now, not omega prime. And this two pi cancels this two pi. And in parentheses, well, this we have a one here and omega minus itself is, is zero. And so this is also one. So we get a two here plus e to the minus i. Well, let me, let me rearrange, let me switch the order of those two terms. So e to the i omega tau plus the minus i now it's just omega the delta function tau. Okay, so, so we could go two, two ways here. One way is it's common to write this combination as two cosine of omega tau, but I'm actually gonna go a different route to make it look like the result we want. 
So this is all this is almost a Fourier transform. It's like a called a Fourier cosine transform. But to, to really get it as a proper Fourier transform, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take take this second term. I still have an integral here. Uh, I'm going to take the second term, and I'm going to do. Uh, I'm going to change change variables. So. I'm going to take this whole second term and I'm going to let, so omega prime is gone, but I'm going to reintroduce a version of it. Omega prime, but omega prime equal minus omega. So this turns d omega into minus d omega prime. I'm only going to do this for the second term. And it turns the limits of this integral. The limits of this integral are going to go now from plus infinity down to minus infinity. And if I switch the limits of this integral to make them the normal limits, it will introduce a minus sign that will cancel out this minus sign. So, so the net effect is that this, this doesn't do anything other than change the sign here. It also changes the signs here. But remember that E is a real, a real field. So E uh, if, if E itself is a real field, then E tilde of minus omega is just the complex conjugate of E of plus omega. So by changing, uh, by going from omega to minus omega, the only thing that happens is that these, these two terms flip, um, flip the order in the multiplication, but that, that of course doesn't matter. This first term is going to be e of minus omega prime. That's just going to turn into this e star. And e star, I can write that as uh, e star of minus omega. That's just e of, of plus omega. So sort of you know, changing variables and going through all this, all that does is it turns this last term into an identical, uh, identical copy of this middle term. So now we have 2 as a constant here, plus 2 of those terms. And that's going to cancel out the, the two out here. So kind of having done all that, I have one over eta integral from minus infinity to infinity, d omega over two pi. Um, e, e tilde of omega. Um, let me even write this this pair of terms now, I can just write it as magnitude of, of E of omega magnitude squared. And the two has canceled that too. So I have one plus E to the I omega tau. Okay, and this is exactly what we wanted. This first term here is just a total intensity. So, uh, yeah, this first term here is just the total intensity. This is just taking the, the spectrum and adding it all up. So this is just I naught. And the second term here, from the definitions I had to erase because I had no room, this is just plus integral from minus infinity to infinity, d omega over 2 pi times um, all the eta and the uh, this magnitude of e of omega squared all combined to give me the, what I called I tilde of omega before, e to the I omega tau. Okay, so this is, this is our final result here, which is that as I turn the knob on the interferometer and I make intensity measurements at different distances, as long as I subtract off the intensity of the source itself, I get back the Fourier transform of the, the intensity spectrum. And so if I, if I have as a function of, of tau, say, if I have an intensity that's, that's some, some offset and I say it looks like this, if this has some, some nice Gaussian 
shape. Uh, this looks like uh, a Gaussian times a cosine, right? Shifted up by I naught, shifted up by some, some overall intensity. So the first thing we do is we subtract off I naught and we're back to a Gaussian times a cosine. And the Fourier transform of a Gaussian times a cosine, if I were to write this in terms of omegas, this is just a Gaussian centered around some, some particular, uh, some particular uh, non-zero frequency that gave me this, this cosine. So if I had, if, if my source had a nice Gaussian spectral profile, what I would get out of my interferometer would be this, a pattern that looked like this. It would be some offset times this Gaussian times the cosine where, where this sort of frequency of the cosine is omega naught. And remember the narrower, the narrower the, the Gaussian is on one side of the Fourier transform, the wider the Gaussian is on the other side of the Fourier transform. So as I go from white light to LED to laser, the spectrum gets narrower and narrower and narrower. And that means that the pattern of interference fringes I see would get wider and wider and wider. Now, not, not every spectrum is a Gaussian, but they all behave in the same scaling way. The narrower it is in one domain, the wider it would be in another domain. So there, we, we've, we've showed that the intensity you get out of the interferometer gives you all the information you need by taking an inverse Fourier transform to recover the, uh, the intensity spectrum. And again, this is mostly used in the infrared where the interferometers aren't quite as, as finicky. And the chemists really like this technique because uh, they only need one infrared detector. It's not like a spectrometer where you need detectors to capture, capture everywhere, the, uh, everywhere the light spreads out. You only need one detector and you just scan this interferometer back and forth and measure the intensity coming out of that detector and you can get the, the spectrum of the light that you put into the interferometer. All right, that is, that is all for coherence theory. Uh, let me see if anyone has any questions after that, you know, what is probably the most complicated uh, set of math we're, we're gonna do in the course. Um, and I, uh, we, I may, I may give you one week, uh, one, one or two days next week to work on the, to work on the assignment. Uh, half of the assignment is a Python tutorial that takes you through how to do Fourier transforms in Python. And if you've never done anything like that, uh, I, I walk you through step by step, but I would encourage you at, at every step to explore a little bit, you know, look at the arrays you get, plot things. You know, I, I suggest you plot certain things, but I would encourage you to plot even more on your, on your way. Um, so we, we may take some some class time for, for you to go through that and, and ask questions. Um, and then our, our final big, big topic will be diffraction. And that will involve two-dimensional Fourier transforms. So um, all this stuff about adding up e to the i omega t's, we're going to be adding up e to the i k x's, uh, or so, i, I k r's, where k is a vector now and R is X, Y, and maybe X, Y, and Z. So uh, this was the, but the things we're gonna add up might, might not be as complicated as this. All right, so let me, let me take any questions anyone might have, otherwise I'll, uh, I'll call it a day. <laughs>